Gotham needs something more, something worse to defend her. She needs a new myth, a legend more powerful than I can be right now. A legend that can only rise from the ashes of the Batman. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Brothers Discuss. I am Alex. And I'm Chris. And we're not going to beat around the bush too much with the opening of the show because just last week at the re- at the time of recording this, uh, we got the sad news that Kevin Conroy, the famous voice of Batman from multiple cartoon series and video games and, and even a live action appearance here and there, has sadly passed away. Yeah, very sad news. And it, it's... It's it's really sad because I feel like a lot of generations that like got into Batman, th- th- there's always been like some iteration of that character that Con really has uh, portrayed as for like people to grow up with. Um, for us, I-, I think I could speak on both of us. That was definitely the the animated series and the Arkham mm-hmm. games that were the big ones. Yeah. It it is very sad. Uh, the animated series started in 1992, and being a product of the 90s myself, I, I was I was exposed to it pretty early on, and it's a huge part of me being a Batman fan. Uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Conroy is the voice, like you said, a lot of us associate with Batman, reading comics and so forth. Uh, and it's sad we'll never hear him perform again. I mean, yeah. he, he was still doing stuff very recently. Like, uh, I like know. He, like, the Arkham games were obviously very recent, but he did a live-action appearance on Batwoman, and he did, like, what, the Justice League action show, he, and he would still show up on, like, Teen Titans Go and things like that. Yeah. And he was still playing the character up until recently, so it is very sad. And I've heard he was, like, incredibly lovely to meet based on people's stories at conventions and what have you. And I remember watching him in an interview once when he was doing theater and all that growing up and reconnecting with someone he had acted with like a lot very early in his career saying like isn't it weird that we're not doing the shakespeare stuff that like we were trained to do and his friend was like well this is way cooler you're batman and (laughs) he made a whole career out of playing batman and i think that's really great it's just sad that he's gone it's very sad and um yeah it's like i said like this is just for a lot of people, I think this kind of goes without saying is like when people think of their like definitive Batman, uh, whatever, you know, about their comics, the shows, games, movies, whatever. I, I feel like a lot of people, even before his death, would point at uh, his Kevin Conroy's performance, specifically in the animated series, because that to me was like the um, at, at that time, because you, you had Adam West with, you know. Silly, but at the time that was him in the comics. Tim Burton's really just dark and not very comic accurate, but aesthetically pleasing take on Batman. Um, and then by the time you get Kevin Conroy into all of this, it's like that is Batman. That is the character. That's the voice. That's the mannerism. It's like everything is just nailed with Kevin Conroy. And it is it is really sad mm-hmm. um, that, yeah, this is it for him. Yeah, you are right in saying that he'll definitely be remembered as the definitive voice of Batman, and that's already been the case, but he's had such a long career in the role, and there have been other good voice actors in the role. Like, I really like uh, Bruce Greenwood's voice in Young Justice, and in the movies, both Robert Pattinson and Val Kilmer have really great Batman voices as well, but in terms of the person who will be remembered the most and who played him for such a long time, even if someone else comes along in the future and plays him for 30 years or whatever, it's going to be Conroy until the end of time. Like, Oh yeah. He, he'll be remembered as the definitive Batman voice. And when there is so much Batman out there, not just in animation, in live action and comics and video games and so on and so forth, like to be the definitive version of that character, or at least voice wise, like, that's a hell of a feat. Like, and I think his best performance in the role is Mask of the Phantasm. And oh yeah, the scene where he's talking to his parents' grave about how he didn't count on being happy. Like, just just the emotion in his voice. It, it's so good. It, it's really terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Have you watched it? Rewatched any episodes recently since then? I haven't, but I, I have been replaying the Arkham games. So, okay. There you uh, go. I'm in that 
season. So mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but where the gray ghost um, was trending for a little while on Twitter. Um, and deservedly. So it's a, one of the best episodes. It's just such a, a touching and haunting episode now with uh, it's very meta take on media. Cause it, that, that's the episode that features both uh, Conroy and Adam West uh, um, in, in the same episode together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what an icon for sure. Yeah. <sighs> well, we've got a few things to discuss today, Chris. Um, let's start d- dive into star Wars again. <laughs> Uh, so we're here to talk about the the new Star Wars show, not Andor. We're not going to talk about Andor. Yet. Um, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about uh, Tales of the Jedi. And, and no, we're not even going to touch on the Studio Ghibli stuff, that was, that thing that got released the other day. That, that was garbage. Did you watch that? <laughs> I didn't watch that. I didn't even know what the hell you're talking about. But So, yeah, Studio <laughs> Ghibli... Uh, actually collaborated with Lucasfilm and put together like a three minute thing with Grogu and it was awful. Oh, maybe I did see something about that. I, I did not, but yeah, I never watched it, but it's a waste uh, of time and I wouldn't recommend okay. it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, Tales of the Jedi. Yeah. It's let's talk, the, let, let's talk about the, uh, the six shorts slash mini series slash TV show slash, uh, uh, yet another excuse from Dave Filoni to keep the clone wars alive. <laughs> Yeah, so it is in the style. <laughs> it is in the style of the Clone Wars series, which I I, I think that style has evolved over time. It uh, has. But... So yeah, like you said, it's it's six episodes. It's like fifteen minutes each. Uh, three of the, the episodes are focused on Count Dooku, and the other three are on Ahsoka Tano. So mm-hmm. ba- but, so basically, uh, with the Count Dooku episodes, you have an episode that's focused on like a younger Dooku with where Qui-Gon is still his apprentice. And then the other one's focus on like an adventure with Mace Windu. And then the third one, is basically, we just turns to the dark side. And then Which, the, was that? Uh, for me, the, the one where he turns to the dark side, that's, been, that's the best one out of all six. Personally. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then with Ahsoka, there's one where she's like a, a little baby. And then and there's she, one, she has the force. Yep. And then there's uh, <laughs> one where she's like her, her early in her career as a Jedi. And then, the next, the last one's like um, her post Jedi era. Yeah. Um. So, it's, what do you think of it? <sighs> okay, it's I, I never really asked for more Clone Wars type content, uh, because we have a lot <laughs> of that on the shelf right now. Uh, seven. Se- well. This thing just, like, cannot end. It was supposed to end at season five, and then it went to six season, seven season. Bad Batch is basically just continuing that, and then now we have this. Um, so I wasn't, like, really excited because I don't really need more of this. Plus, it was, like, it, when I saw the trailer, it was, like, six little shorts, and I'm like, okay. So it, it felt like this was just, we need to have some little shorts on our Star Wars part of Disney+. Plus. Um, so I really didn't have like any expectations for this, uh, and there are some really good moments. I do think um, the one that I liked was Count Dooku basically just turning to the dark side. Uh, my favorite moment is when he's kind of like reflecting on Qui Gon's death, and he's just at that tree. It's it's very nice, and I also like the episode where Ahsoka's training, and it's kind of like a montage throughout. Basically, all of the Clone Wars, like a start, middle, end kind of thing, and um, that one was pretty good as well. It's not something I'll, I'll probably never watch this ever again, <laughs> mm-hmm. but um, I don't know. It, it's a surprise to be sure, but a kind of welcome one. <laughs> <laughs> to quote, I'm not in, to, to quote, to quote young, beautiful Palpatine. And I, they even got Ian, Ian McDermott back for this. I don't know. I was surprised and, to see and that. And we have Beeson, like, in the same yeah. episode. <laughs> and we finally got Yaddle doing something. <laughs> Just <laughs> Yaddle. Uh, yeah, this is pretty good. Um, I would say this isn't really essential. If you're, if you're like, a, not a fan of Star Wars or even just a casual fan, I, I don't think this is necessarily essential. Yeah. Um, I will say, though, I don't care about this at all. 
but I've seen lots of discussions on this. Like, this basically destroys a lot of canon. Um, <laughs> and it introduced a lot of new canon. So, uh, which isn't anything new with, like, the Disney Star Wars. Because, I mean, famously, when Disney bought Lucasfilm, uh, they made it very clear early on that uh, the ex- like the expanded universe or whatever it was called, it, like that's all garbage now. It's it's going in the garbage bin. Uh, everything we make going forward, whether it's movies, whatever, that's the new canon. Like like I said, it's not just the movies and cartoons. It's the video games. It's the comics. Like not only did they wipe things from existence, but they were also doing these other things. Like the fucking theme park is canon. <laughs> like, do you remember at one of their announcements where they had like an MCU like timeline of the upcoming projects? I do, I do. Galaxy's Edge was up there, and I was like, "Is that the theme park? Like, what the hell do you it's mean that canon. that's canon? Like, how does that work? Is that a ride? Like, if it's a ride, then put the name of the ride on there. Like, what the hell do you do with a theme park? I, I, I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so so. This retcons the recent Ahsoka book that came out like a few years ago. We're basically, I mean, for one, season seven of Clone Wars apparently also uh, retcons the book a little bit in that, you know, similar events happen in the show, but it's now it's like through a different lens, you know, stuff like that. But then with Count Dooku, like, I, I think like years ago, like there was like a, a book, like it's more like a journal. Like there's no proper narrative in the book it's just like a journal entries written from the perspective of count dooku uh, but i think in that it establishes that he left the jedi order like before the events of the phantom menace uh, but now here he leaves after qui-gon dies which is completely different <laughs> and i don't care <laughs> it's, if yeah it's, you you really have to have like such a a locked you know, way of enjoying Star Wars. If you, if you really care about like canon that much, you just can't enjoy Star Wars. It's, it's just that. <laughs> it's just that. Yeah, and and the funny thing with Count Dooku is that I like Dooku and everything but the movies because he's just a, <laughs> a, he's just like a nothing character in those two movies. But with the right material, they do a lot of cool things with Dooku, and I like it. That's what I like. Um... Yeah, I, I didn't like Dooku in the movies. I didn't really like him in the Clone Wars either. I thought, like, you know, he was cool, but he was just kind of there because he had to be. Um, this is the only time I've ever really liked Dooku, so... Interesting. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I remember watching Episode 2 for the first time and being confused by that character and just feeling like he didn't fit the rest of the movie to me. And I think a part of it was because it was Christopher Lee. <laughs> and I didn't really know him from anything else at the time, but I knew yeah. he was this distinguished actor. Like, but then he watched the third one. He just dies in the beginning. And <laughs> I was like, oh, they just got rid of this distinguished actor that they had. Like, why did Christopher Lee agree to this? Like, Count Dooku has always been amusing to me. <laughs> you know, and even if you like if you just watch the movies and nothing else. Like, you watch Attack of the Clones, and Padme, like, in the beginning, she almost gets killed from an assassination attempt. And she's like, well, I think Count Dooku's behind it. And the Jedi are like, no, it can't be Dooku. Like, he's a political idealist, not a murderer, says ki Mundi. When, if you're a rational-thinking person, you're probably thinking, who the fuck is Count Dooku? <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't even see Dooku until, like, an hour and 30 minutes in that fucking movie and he's supposed to be the main villain <laughs> yeah it's and later on with that scene with obi-wan he's like there's a sith lord controlling the senate and together we will destroy the sith we get that and like it may be difficult to secure your release and then he dies it, it's it's almost as if those movies should have had an overarching villain for all you know? three movies and it's funny because you look at interviews of Christopher Lee, like he will give like thousand paragraph like descriptions of his character in Lord of the Rings. But then when he's asked about like his involvement with Star Wars, he's like, well, I also do Star Wars with George Lucas. And I couldn't even begin to tell you what what that's about. <laughs> See, <laughs> he says something like that. <laughs> I have a respect for actors, weirdly enough, even though it's not 
honorable at all of being in something big for the bait the paycheck like there is something in there that i respect yeah and uh, i guess recently this another recent example like uh, yaya abdul uh, mateen uh, and he's the guy that recently got cast as wonder man for the mcu uh, and he's in Aquaman as well. Um, mm-hmm. but he got in some hot water recently because he considers like doing like superhero blockbuster work, like clown work, and people got offended by him saying that. <laughs> uh, and he was also in the Watchmen TV series, the HBO Watchmen show. And, and spoilers for that show to anyone that wants to watch it. He's just kind of a regular guy in it. And then the reveal is that he's not a regular guy. Like he's actually Doctor Manhattan. Like it, and it was silly. Um, I didn't love the HBO show. Like I liked aspects of it, and there were a couple episodes that I liked. But just as a whole, like this is the problem with a lot of Lindelof stuff because, it, well, it, it simultaneously was its own thing, but it beats you over the head with stuff that you know from the Watchmen comic. And I don't know. It's kind of like you know, speaking of Star Wars, it's like the Force Awakens, in that it does a really good job of introducing Ray and Finn. And making these characters likable so that you're not looking at your watch waiting for Han Solo or whoever to show up. But then it also gives you all the nostalgia and Easter egg stuff that you expect to see as well. How do we get into the, how do we get into the Watchmen? <laughs> um, oh, the, the actor, right. Um, but he was yeah. also really good in uh, Trial of the Chicago 7 movie, uh, the, the, the Sorkin movie. Uh, another writer everyone loves. Mm. <laughs> he and Damon Lindelof and these guys should all get together do one of those like writers roundtable things that they do around like award season time like, yeah. <laughs> who, who else is another writer we can throw in like I mean Simon Kimberg is another you can throw in throw him right. in there uh, let's throw in Joss Whedon <laughs> um, but yeah okay back to Tales of the Jedi uh, Ahsoka uh, I thought the Ahsoka episodes were fine they were serviceable but it's like, ah, we have, we've had enough Ahsoka. I, I, I want to see them do more obscure characters now. Let's do well, a Lola get ready. one. She's, she's getting her own show again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's do a Lobot show already. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Season two. <laughs> you can get like Kit Fistu, Kiati Mundi, all these Jedi. Get their own stories. <laughs> um, I actually found this out. So apparently in... Um, the first Count Dooku episode, Qui-Gon, the younger Qui-Gon, is voiced by Liam Neeson's son. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, so, that's it. yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like Tom Hanks letting his brother, like, uh, play Woody <laughs> in, like, <laughs> everything else but the movies. He's like, I'm only going to do the movies. He's like, you, you, you could be toy me. He's like, wow, thanks for throwing me that bone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just if you're wa- if you want to watch Star Wars, just watch Andor. A truly, truly great show right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, to move on to something that's good, um, I saw the Banshees of Inisherin. Um, it's a pretty great film. It's uh, Mar McDonough who, um, who did Three Billboards, In Bruges, Seven Psychopaths. Uh, if you like his work, I think you'll like this film. I'm not familiar with his plays. He's also a playwright. Um, he's written a bunch of plays. and I believe this film was based on a play he never published. It, it was intended to be the third in a trilogy of plays that he'd done. I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, it's a black comedy, like all of his work. And I laughed a lot. I was disturbed a lot. And it's kind of not like anything else I've watched this year. And I say that in a good way. And... It's very different to In Bruges as well, which I think is what a lot of people compare it to because it shares a lot with it. And obviously Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson are in it. I do still prefer In Bruges for, for the record, but they just share a lot of the same elements. But I did like this a lot, and I should probably explain what it's about. So Brendan Gleeson's character doesn't want to be friends with Colin Farrell's character anymore. That is pretty much what it's about. Okay. <laughs> is, it's not realistic because who does not want to be friends with Colin Farrell? Like, he's cool as hell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, but but Farrell's character doesn't really understand why. Like, he didn't do anything to offend or upset him. And it's basically about two people dealing with one of the parties not wanting to be in each other's lives anymore and how you react to that. 
and the performances are all really great. Um, Barry Keoghan, that little weirdo, uh, he's great as well. Uh, Carrie Condon plays uh, Farrell's sister, and, and she's pretty great too. And uh, I hate making everything about this, but I don't know if I know her from anything. And it turns out I've not seen her in anything, but I know I've heard her voice. And she's Friday, Tony Stark's AI after Jarvis. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mentioned three billboards earlier, and I also really like that. But there are elements like the tonal shifts in it that it bothered me a little bit because it's, I mean, it's very tough to balance comedy with the subject matter of that film. I mean, subject matter of a couple of elements of it. And I have a similar feeling with this one, and I can't go into it without spoiling it, but I did prefer it in this. And I liked how it feels like an exploration of depression or not feeling like you're fulfilling your purpose in life and how simple hatred or having an adversary is while there's also a literal wall going in the on in the background it like literally in the background i found that really interesting but i'm really glad i got to see it um brendan gleason is always great but colin farrell it's been a really great year for him Uh, (laughs) again like the batman and I, i haven't seen the new ron howard film that came out this year but he's had a really great year it's gonna be Mm-hmm. Uh, again, not that award season is everything, but it's going to be a tough year for uh, best actor wise, just because there are a lot of great performances and some that have yet to come out. But Colin Farrell's might be my favorite so far this year. Like, okay, every, every little thing he does has something behind it, and he's fantastic. So, a really good film. That's a recommendation. All right, have you seen anything recently? Uh, nothing too much outside of a really, really big thing that we'll talk about. <laughs> All right, so before we get to the main event, I just have one other film I'd like to discuss, and that is um, Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Um, it's the Weird Al Yankovic biopic. Um, I should establish that first uh, that I did enjoy it. I'm going to be saying some negative stuff, but I liked it, everybody. Uh, there are a lot of funny moments. I mean, the ending and... I don't want to build this up for people who have yet to see it, but the ending made me laugh harder more than a movie has in a really long time, or, or a recent movie anyway. Uh, I think the rest of the movie is more musing than it is hilarious, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do kind of wish that I saw this with an audience, because I do know lots of people that went and saw this in theaters, and I wonder if it would have played better with other people around, but... There are some very funny moments. And Daniel Radcliffe is kind of perfect for what they're doing with this because by regular biopic standards, he's entirely wrong to play Weird Al. Like, he's way too short and everything, but that's kind of the point. Like, there's a part in the film where it shows a People magazine cover with Weird Al as the, as the sexiest man alive. And it's funny because... Daniel Radcliffe is obviously a very handsome man, but with the Weird Al mustache and glasses and the curly hair, like, that's funny, and it's just a throwaway gag, and I wish the film was a little weirder in that sense, uh, no pun intended. Uh, But there's a moment where Madonna comes to Weird Al's house, and he's closing the door, like, the the front door to his house, and he just goes, while trying to close it it's very sudden and super random but i laughed a lot at that and i wish there was some more moments like that during the film because there's no explanation for it and it was funny uh, there's a, there, there is a subplot where during the film um uh, weird out decides to no longer make parody songs so he writes the greatest song of all time eat it and it's <laughs> and in the movie it's not a parody of Beat It. Uh, and that's really funny to me. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, like, I, like I said, it's good. It's made by the, uh, the Funny or Die folk for Roku. And it's based on an original short of, of theirs where it's a fake trailer. And Aaron Paul plays Weird Al. And it was making fun of the overly dramatic biopics of celebrities and how hard and terrible their life is. Like the struggle and... And everything and how they overcome it. Like, we see a thousand of them with musicians. Like, I mean, Elvis only came out this year. And we're getting a Whitney Houston movie as well. And I, I think Daniel Radcliffe said in an interview, like, it, it might have been, the, like, the most iconic character 
series, video series, uh, but that this was shot in a matter of weeks. And unfortunately, it feels like that. Uh, like I said, it, it's made by the Funny or Die people for Roku, and, and the movie does feel like it has that budget and was made really quick. Like, the director is also the writer, so it's not for me to say he should have been the director. Like, it, it, It's not like they just picked some random guy in the street, but it probably could have used someone who was a little more visually interesting, I guess. But I enjoyed it. Like, If you're a Weird Al fan like me, I would recommend seeing it because it is very fun, and... Over the credits, there's a montage of photos like they have at the end of those movies, like like photos from the person's real life, and those cracked me up big time. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's a good movie. And if it'll please the court, Weird Al has given everyone permission to pirate this movie, so take from that <laughs> what you will. <laughs> uh, so now onto the main event. We're, of course, going to be talking about Black Panther, or Disney's Marvel's Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever. So, so. I guess I'll, I'll kick things off first. I'll say... Okay. I enjoyed Wakanda Forever. Um, I like when the MCU films take themselves a little seriously and not everything's a joke. Like, that's a nice change of pace. I appreciate that. Like, after Thor and She-Hulk, it was nice to have something that was like, okay, things feel like they matter here. But the one drawback from that is that some of the comedy really feels a little forced. Like, it, it feels like a studio mandate to have it there. Like, there's a funny line that Namor has. That I, I wonder if you know the one I'm, ta- I'm referring to without me is saying it, it. But it I, felt... I think I do. Does it... <sighs> I, I kind of want to, like, get into spoilers now just so I can figure out what this is. I'm pretty what? sure I know what you're talking about. But... <sighs> Yeah, but it, like it, it felt a little out of character for that character to say. I'll say that. Uh, but that's like sort of the drawback of having a movie that's a little more serious. But I I do like that this movie felt that like it had stakes. Like I think it handled the stuff with T'Challa no longer being around quite well. But yeah, I thought it was good. Uh, the CGI still doesn't look that great. I, I thought this would look better than the first one, and I know it's got a different cinematographer, but This had three editors. Uh, When that came up in the credits, I went, what? (laughs) And I I, I don't know. I just don't think it looked better. Like, I don't think the action looked better, but I don't know if that's Ryan Coogler's forte. But the character stuff is good, and I still like the world of Wakanda that was established in the last one. And, yeah, I thought this was a good film. How about you? Okay, that's very interesting. So, uh, I think I need to give a little context on uh, my overall views of the first movie. Uh, I enjoyed the first one a lot. Um, I, I, it, it's not without its problems, however, and I think like the best way I can just briefly describe the first movie is that it's a lot of like great characters and a lot of really, really great ideas and themes put into a very messy script where the movie ends where all the themes come clashing in a CGI rhino battle. <laughs> um, I, there, there's a lot of like great things going on in the first movie, but I can't say that the overall movie is great. With that being said, I love Wakanda Forever a lot. <laughs> and kind of what you were saying is that this does treat itself a lot more seriously. Um, but I, I, I think... Like what won this movie over for me, and it it really it definitely kicked in a lot more in like the second half of the movie. Uh, I there I do have problems with it, and we'll talk about that when we get into spoilers. But uh, what I really loved about this movie is that all of the usual Marvel uh, Marvel hallmarks that you would have in all of these, um, all of the, uh, the 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 big fight scenes and the new suits and everything it. Um, sure, behind the scenes, at the end of the day, it probably is just a memo from Kevin Feige saying, make sure we have all this stuff in the movie, but it it, it was handled in the film, uh, I thought it was seamless, and I, I thought, like, it was just, it, it didn't feel like it was really that forced, and it felt very natural, and it, it, I, I what, the, the big thing that I just love about this movie so much is that, it doesn't feel like it's trying to take a slot of the MCU. It, it feels like it's just 
it's it's just a really good sequel to Black Panther. Uh, it, it does have things that it's setting up and connecting to, which we'll talk about. But um, this is, for the first time since like the Guardians movies, this just feels like a really solid movie in the MCU, and it's not a MCU project number thirty eight. And you know, it, it doesn't feel like this is. It doesn't really feel like. I mean, it does feel like it's the end of Phase Four, but it doesn't feel like um, it, it's being built up to, or is built up to in the phase. It just felt like this is just a really solid movie, and that's why it really stands out to me as one of the best Marvel movies ever in the MCU. Okay, let's jump into spoilers. All right. All right. So let's. Let's talk about that line. <laughs> that, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume it's the line where, like, uh, he wants to show Shuri just whatever city, the underwater world, and he's like, the, the water's going to crush you, the pressure's just going to be too tight, or you can wear a suit. We have a few of those lying around. Yep, that's the one. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the one. Um, I guess on the subject of Namor, I quite liked Namor. Neymar was really he was cool. He, he was he was really cool. I think I like Killmonger more as far Fair as enough. villains go, uh, but he was still a really really great villain. One of the best we've had recently in Marvel. Yeah, and I will say as much as I I, I, I kind of critique the action a little bit, but I did like the the final sequence of um, Namor and the, the new Black Panther. Uh, a lot more than the Black Panther versus Killmonger sequence. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, because. This doesn't have like the recreation of the Spider-Man three free fall or yeah uh, like, or the, the first X-Men movie like Wolverine going across the Statue of Liberty thing. Right. Like you, you were talking about the CGI earlier. I, I do partially agree that it's still it, it's not its best that I've seen in Marvel and even in phase four. I've seen better than this. But I do, I did think it looked better than the first one by a lot, and especially okay. with the ending stuff, the final battle between the new Black Panther and Namor. Uh, visually, yeah, it looked better than um, you know Black Panther Killmonger, but it was also uh, I think I just put that aside, even just the visuals, because again, it just felt like that was built up better. It, it, the fight didn't feel like it just was forced to be there. It felt like that would actually happen given what uh Shuri's character just went through. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> let's go ahead and talk about get into the the, the real life tragedy of uh Chadwick Boseman and how this was handled. So I I have some thoughts about um how it was handled here because overall I think this is a lovely tribute to um the Chadwick Boseman. Uh but there is like a a weird feeling I I get from the beginning of the movie where you're like watching a fictional character's funeral, but it's based on an actual person, real life person's real life illness. Like it, it, it is a kind of weird feeling, but it's done really well. Yeah. And I, I was, um, I was surprised that the movie started that way and where it's actually at T'Challa's death. You, you don't see him obviously, but yeah. And I was, uh, I am quite surprised we that they did not attempt to do like a CG Chadwick Boseman. Oh or, God, I'm so glad they didn't do that. Like um, I was certain we were gonna get. I mean, speaking of Star Wars, like Ray, like like the cobbled together audio of like Alec Guinness. Like I was certain that they, they were gonna that we were gonna hear that like a, like a, a Shuri, like something yeah. like that, and we didn't. And I applaud them for showing restraint. Um, or respect. That's probably the better word because it's I, not like um, a recent example um, would be the latest Ghostbusters movie, which I haven't watched, but I know that there's the CGI Harold Ramis in there, mm -hmm. and they keep cutting to his face so much in like the the last scene of the movie. Yeah, and you know, it, it's you don't need that. <laughs> Yeah, even, even if your theme is about like the legacy of this character and how that transpires to a new character, you still don't literally need to see the old character in here, even if 
you know. Yeah, there were parts where, <laughs> like, like Angela Bassett uh, says early on that when she's, like, meditating or whatever, like, she can feel, like, the hand of T'Challa on her shoulder or, or whatever, and I was thinking, oh, no. I was gonna... really worried they were going to do that at the end, and I'm really glad it was just a montage of, um, of like, scenes you footage. see of him. Yeah. Which is, works perfect. It got the job done right there. So I, I think it just goes to show, I think these guys had more respect than some other filmmakers or producers <laughs> out there. Though so that being said, I kind of would like to see them just use Alec Guinness saying, Shuri? Shuri? Black Panther? <laughs> you want to go to Laser Moon? Um, <laughs> while we're talking about this, I was when I was watching the movie, um, yeah, we're in spoilers now, so there, there's the scene where... Uh, Killmonger shows up in the ancestral plane. Uh, you, you think it's yeah. gonna be mom at first, and in the back of my head, it's like, oh, you don't see her at first. They're probably gonna do something stupid and show CGI Chadwick Boseman. And then I see Michael B. Jordan, and I'm like, whoa! <laughs> and that yeah. was awesome. <laughs> I had like the same reaction actually. And uh, I'll, I'll, let me get back to that real quick. I want to talk about Shuri here real quick. Okay. Yeah. Because. In the first film, I liked Shuri in the sense that she was a very different character to T'Challa. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I liked that they weren't squabbling siblings because I fucking hate that in movies. But I, I did like that they were different people and had different personalities within a royal family. And I like Letitia Wright in the first one. And look, this has got nothing to do with her beliefs in real life or whatever. This has nothing to do with that. Purely based on the performance in the film. I liked the character in this film, but I wasn't as big a fan of her performance. And to me, she felt a little out of her depth in the serious stuff. Like, when, like, like you're saying, when she does go into the ancestral plane, like, we see her walking around the throne. You realize it's not going to be Angela Bassett. Like, what the hell is going to happen here? And there was a moment where you could tell it was a man. And much like you, for a split second, I was like, holy shit, did they film something with Chadwick Boseman like a long time ago? And then it was fucking Michael B. Jordan. And I was like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> and look, now, all due respect to everyone in the film, Michael B. Jordan has a different presence. Like, his one scene in the film, I was like, man, that guy jumps off the screen. He's really, really something. Oh, he's he's a terrific actor. And that actually got me uh, thinking about something separate. Um, so Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is coming out soon. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ryan Coogler, I, I think Michael B. Jordan has been in every single one of his movies. He is. They kept the streak going. And so I'm wondering if we're going to get something similar with Michael Rooker uh, as Yondu in, in, the, in, in Guardians of the Galaxy 3, if we're going to get a scene of like a flashback or something with him, which could entirely be possible and... <laughs> That that would be hard to watch because he had one of the best deaths in the MCU, but mm-hmm. yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but yeah, I, but I really like that scene, and I like how her arc begins to mirror that of T'Challa's in Civil War, and they mm-hmm. have a line of like "Vengeance is consuming us." Like I like that, but I wasn't sure the actress was the right pick in that sense to carry the weight of what they were doing with that character. I, I can see where you're coming from somewhat with this. Um, I don't agree. I, I thought she was, as a character, yeah, she was much better in this one than she was in the first one. I thought she was fine. I thought she was fun in the first one, but she was just a fun side character in the first one. Um, and here she has a lot more to do, and I, I don't think, you know, it's the best performance I've ever seen, but, like, I thought she did a good job with what she had, but... I, I do see where you're coming from, and it, it wouldn't have hurt to just throw in a few more notches uh, with, with some of these more dramatic scenes. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, because Shuri now has to like um, grow up in a lot of ways and mature from what we last saw her as, and they basically gave all her sass to the new character. <laughs> so, so, Ironheart... <laughs> Let's let's talk about Ironheart. Um, All right, so right <laughs> off the bat, the CG for Ironheart fucking sucked. Yeah, it wasn't great, but I, so th- this is one of the things in the movie that uh, is clearly just a really big setup for her own show, kind mm. of, but not really. 
uh, because th- there's an interesting moment where uh, after the day is won and everything, uh, Shuri says, you know, your design's great, but we're keeping the suit. So she didn't really need to be in this. <laughs> Yeah, um, and it's like she feels more like a MacGuffin than she does like an actual character to me. Yeah, th- this is one of my few like big problems with the movie. And it's not the worst thing in the world just because, uh, like, thank God she doesn't have the spotlight in the movie. Um, it, that That's given to, um, obviously, Shuri, Okoye as well, and I forget the queen's name, the mother. Yeah, uh, Angela Bassett's character. A- Angela Bassett, yeah, and... and her with all that so uh i i i i can't say like i flat out hated her appearance in this but it just mm-hmm. did not need to be in here and especially given the movie's runtime it wouldn't have hurt to cut that out <laughs> and something else that i also want to talk about <laughs> okay uh, um which again follows the themes of connecting to other things we have elaine from seinfeld in this <laughs> She's been in a few Marvel projects. Um, not doesn't really have a place in all of this um, because I feel like her appearance in Falcon the Winter Soldier and Black Widow was to kind of set up the Thunderbolts. Like she's kind of like the Nick Fury to Thunderbolts. Mm. So I don't really know what she's doing in this, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I'm glad you brought the runtime because the film that this kind of reminded me the most, besides the first Black Panther was Eternals, uh, because it was in the, in the fact that it was very slow and very methodical. And then I looked at the run times of both and I'm like, Oh, that's part of why, like it took the time to be slow, but yeah. And, and look, I'm not one of those people who go like, Oh, I don't have time for a three hour movie. I got other shit to do because I don't give a shit about that. We, we like, watched and love the Batman and that's exactly three hours long. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I do think this was a little on the long side. And if it were up to me, I would have gotten rid of that Agent Ross subplot completely. That was yeah. totally unnecessary. And it, and it I like Agent Ross. I like Agent Ross, and I, and I like Martin Freeman, but that was so random. And I, I guess it's maybe setting something up in the future, but I don't know. I, I don't know. Like I said, it's it doesn't feel like this is contributing to whatever her character's name is, Val, like just to what she's doing. Again, I'm thinking, like, she's more setting up the Thunderbolts. I don't know what that has to do with this movie at all, but <laughs> she's, yeah. she's just there. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. It popped to my head. How was your theater experience for this movie? Because I like to bring um, this up a lot. <laughs> okay. I actually had kind of an annoying theater experience. Oh, you did? Not, not that it was bad. I mean, it, it was kind of like your standard Marvel. They they clapped whenever cool things happen, which, you know, that, that stuff was fine. But uh, I just had a lot of people talking during the movie, and yeah. that was quite annoying. And I, 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 I try to see these. I, I don't like seeing Marvel movies opening nights anymore just because I, I generally just like to be with a, a much more calm audience. But I try to see these as soon as possible so I don't get spoiled about anything because that's happened to me more than once in Phase 4 where I wait and I get spoiled. Or even if I don't wait, I still get spoiled. But (laughs) so I I had a lot of people talking in this movie, and that was kind of annoying. But I I managed to get through it just because the movie um, was just so good to me. But I I did want to bring up – more stuff about the runtime and it, it's I, I it didn't bother me uh, a lengthy movie like this for the stuff outside of like iron heart and val and uh martin freeman's character everything else i thought was like paced perfectly fine and yeah, no, it, yeah. It, it it can drag at some parts but like it's still um it, it felt like there was a lot of build-up and it was a lot of tension and all that stuff I thought was handled really well, but there's the stuff that connects to everything didn't need to be in this, and you could still cut that out and have a movie that's just built up really well. It doesn't feel too fast, because um, that was one of my complaints with Doctor Strange is that, well, things just happen so fast, and it feels like we need more scenes with certain characters, and they add stuff we don't really need to see, and it's... It felt like there was 20 minutes of that movie that were missing, um, and 
here it's the opposite effect, where it feels like there's 20 minutes in the movie that doesn't need to be there. <laughs> so, so put a pin on that. I've got something else to say about that, but I, <laughs> I'm going to talk about my fear experience real quick because for okay. once, I had a good experience. Oh yeah, very <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good theater experience, and I, I, I think, from my perspective anyway, it feels like the MCU crowd has died. <laughs> <laughs> to it's... me, like, I think Spider, Spider-Man killed them. Spider-Man? Are you sure Hulk didn't kill, like, just the reputation of the MCU <laughs> right now? <laughs> well, see, I think it's like the one-two punch of Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, like, I did not have a very reactionary crowd. I, I had a crowd that laughed at a couple of things, but... Like, I think the crowd found, like, o- Okoye very funny yeah. in my screening. But there wasn't, like, any obnoxious, like, fans, like, going, like, yeah! What? No, yeah! it wasn't that obnoxious. The, the most it got for me was, like, people would clap when Shuri was the new Black Panther. Uh, or they would gasp really loud whenever, like, there was the one scene, like, on the, the bridge in the city where, like, Okoye gets hit with the staff that's, like, on the ground. People were like, ooh! This is that kind of stuff, but yeah. But no, I didn't detect any fake fans this time around. Like when Namor says like uh, Imperious Rex, in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's cool. He said the thing, but nobody reacted to it. And I'm like, uh, okay. Like, I'm not, not that I expect every, anyone to be fans of Namor, because I understand that Namor is a very deep cut kind of character. Mm-hmm. But come on, you've done, you've applauded to more obscure things than that. <laughs> you know you have. Yeah. Uh, I will say that the, the the actor that plays the, the the kid Namor, he looks like straight off the page, like the way he has like his eyebrows raised. Yeah, like, that was, I thought like that kid looks exactly like him. It was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So it's interesting that you said that you felt that there was like not a lot of stuff cut from this movie. I have the opposite. I think there was stuff clearly cut out of the movie. So what do you think? So there's a scene where Okoye goes to visit the newer uh, Dora Milaje. I, I can't remember her name. And she's like, you got to come back. And I was like, oh, did she leave? Like, you know, the, <laughs> you know the scene I'm talking about? Because I do, yeah. It happens in the middle of another scene. But uh, like, I, I'm, I'm not saying, like, I think stuff wasn't cut from this movie. I'm saying, like, stuff could have easily been cut from this movie and it would have sure. helped the runtime. And that those kind of things that you think were cut, you could have just put back in if you really wanted to have yeah. a movie this long. Like, there's a really fantastic scene where Okoye is essentially fired from her job as, like, the head of the Dormelage. And it's an excellent scene. Like, there's that one character that brings up, like, she stood up to her husband where he was assisting Killmonger taking over the country. Like, we get that reference to him. And, like... She could just visit him on the set of Nope, I guess. <laughs> and when she's a civilian, she goes to visit this newish character of the Dormelage about coming back and serving. And there's a scene at the very end where we learn that she and uh, uh, Ao, the new head of the Dormelage, like she was in Civil War, she was in Falcon and Winter Soldier. So it, it makes sense that she would take over the new role because she's the only one we kind of know a little bit. And it's clear that they're a couple, and it was one of those, like, far out, because we barely know this new character. Like, I don't know why she's here. Like, I was just confused by some of these elements of the movie. Like, I, I'm guessing it was meant to be longer with other stuff, and, like, well, we can't cut these things out entirely because we need them to service this other part of the story. I don't know. I, I noticed that in the movie because I felt a lot of that with the... um the American subplot, and it's it, it's funny because uh, Lake Bell is in the movie, and she's an incredible actress, and she was Black Widow in What If, and she's there at the beginning purely just to serve that part of the story, and then later Ross mentions, like, those people died, and it was like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's other stuff with Ross and Val, and th- th- this throwaway line about how they used to be married, and, and again, I was thinking, like, if you take out those sections of the movie completely, like, if you just have the scene of Ross jogging and talks to Okoye and Shuri, do you need him after that? Like, would that have affected the movie at all? And I'm not sure if it would. Like, I do like the looming threat of international war in Wakanda, 
but I got enough of that sense in the beginning with like the hearing and like Dr. Hamilton for Man of Steel. Yeah. It felt like, yeah, like I said, it's stuff like that you can cut out and other stuff that you feel is missing, just put it in its place and it, it would make it feel a lot more coherent. But yeah. And I don't know if you needed him past that. Like I, I thought it was, like I, I said, I thought it was enough of a looming threat after that. Like, I, I don't know, just, and I don't mean the harp on that stuff. Like the movie is better than what's wrong with it, I guess. But yeah, I just noticed that stuff a lot. Yeah. And that's kind of like, like I said, th- those are just like the big things that really stood out to me of like what didn't work in this movie. But like, like you said, it's just the, the stuff that works in this movie is just so much better than what doesn't work in the movie. And the strong points, th- those are worth noting out. And yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's kind of weird that like Okoy was not like reinstated at the, by the end of the movie. I was kind of surprised with that, but... Um, she's a new superhero now, I guess. She is. She's got the weird-looking Iron Man armor, but... That makes her look like the Predator for some reason. I thought that was a little <laughs> weird. Yeah, and they poke fun at it, too, so mm-hmm. it's... Um, so well, I, I guess, guess M'Baku's king now? Yeah, we are king <laughs> M'Baku now, so that's cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. Give, him some, give him some superpowers already, so I don't have to be worried for him constantly. Oh yeah, <laughs> like I was actually like, kind of worried he was gonna die in this one. <laughs> yeah, like when he got punched in the chest, I was like, "Oh no, not Mbaku!" But it was like a comedy bit. He was like, Ugh. "Like so, like oh, thank God." Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about the very ending. I'm talking about the mid credit scene. The mid credit scene. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you explain to the people what happens? Uh, so turns out T'Challa is actually a daddy T'Challa. Um, and Nakia, which I guess we didn't talk about this much because she's not in it too much, uh, but she has, uh, she's with her son, uh, and Shuri's there as well, and yeah, so T'Challa has a son, and he says, I'm, uh, my, my name is T'Challa, and I'm named after King T'Challa. It was a, I thought it was a really nice moment. Yeah, and like Okoy says that she hasn't seen Nakia for six years, so that if you, the timeline, it's like obviously like the end game, like um, time jump, and then the year time jump in this movie. So I, 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 it all adds up, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of clever that they were able to like pull that out uh, with um, Chadwick Boseman's death. Like, there's for no sure. way this was planned out ahead of time. No, not at all. But it works. <laughs> I'm I'm very very curious as to what the original script of this movie was when uh, Chadwick Boseman was still alive. I know, um, and there is no post credit scene in this movie, and I actually thought there might have been something. And it's funny to say because like the whole movie was a tribute to Chadwick Boseman, but I thought there was going to be like a, a featurette type thing to just kind of wrap that up. But yeah. No end credit scene since Endgame. Like, not that long ago, but it was like 800 Marvel projects ago. We didn't have an after <laughs> right. credit scene. A, a whole phase. A whole phase, yeah. But I, I was fine with that. Again, it just oh, yeah. makes it, it So, like, what are you going to do? Are you, you going to have, like, Riri, like, um, shine, like, the Iron Man logo on the ceiling? <laughs> Uh, that took me a minute to get that because <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen so many of these. But yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to talk about from this movie? I'm not. I'm, I don't know. I, I think we hit all the big stuff. But yeah, I mean, like yeah. I said, I think I I did sound negative with this. But I want to stress. I do think this is a good movie. It's just not one of my favorites from the MCU. It's not even my favorite from this phase, if I'm going to be honest. Um, you have the Doctor Strange bias in there. I, I do. <laughs> I, I, I legitimately think Multiverse of Madness was a great movie. <laughs> um, it's the only one I gave like four stars or higher on Letterboxd. This is the only one that I... Uh, yeah, I think this this is the only one that I gave above four stars on Letterboxd. Yeah. I actually gave four and a half. I, uh, that might lower. I need to rewatch it again, but okay. Um, 
where it stands right now, I was just really impressed on just like how much this stood out compared to how much we've gotten in the MCU. Oh, I totally uh, get that. And I, I think we should just like, because now that Phase 4 is over, what do you think of Phase 4? <laughs> well, I think we can all collectively agree that Phase 4 was the worst phase of the MCU by far. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and like, that's there's, some, there's certainly things I liked from Phase 4. That, um, like, I think my favorite things for sure like are Multiverse of Madness, and then I liked WandaVision and Falcon Winter Soldier. Like, those three, I think, are... My favorite, my all-time favorites from that's come out of this phase. Uh, something got me thinking about like Phase Four and kind of Marvel right now. Um, there was like a nice time, um, like when Infinity War and Endgame came out, where um, I, I would like rewatch all the movies just just to get hyped up for the the big Avengers movies, even the ones that like I didn't like or didn't really watch all that much, just on a regular basis. I would still rewatch in preparation for this. And right now with Marvel, I don't have like any motivation to do that it, to when we get to like King dynasty or whatever, because one, there's just so much we have now and it's so hard to like, just keep track of all of it. But two, it's just even on its own. The only things that I've rewatched in phase four are, um, WandaVision and No Way Home. And mm. I guess Multiverse. I saw Multiverse two times in theaters. Okay. Uh, but that's it. Uh, no, nothing else I, I've I've gone back to. Oh, and Falcon. I forgot about Falcon. I did, I did watch rewatch that one too. But um, all the other shows, all the movies, it was just like a one-and-done experience. And we, we were just – we're fed so much of this content. And, yeah, I – that to me has been the biggest problem with Phase Four. Not that I think like everything in Phase Four sucks, uh, because th- there there are some really just good things out there. It's just I don't have the motivation or even just the time before we've moved on to the next thing to go back and check some of these things out. And yeah, and it's I think like, that's, that's the most damaging aspect of Phase Four. Yeah, and I'm still certainly excited. <laughs> like I don't love like the Ant Man movies, but I'm certainly excited to see Ant Man again because I like that character. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll still show up for characters that I like. Like, I like Ant-Man, the Guardians, and I'll show up for those guys. I'll show up for Selvig. Uh, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> I, I actually cheered for his very weird, deep-fake looking cameo. Before. <laughs> deep fakes? What, was, it, was it, like, CGI? I mean, obviously... It looks probably... deep-fake. He, <laughs> it, it, it looks like he, was, he filmed it in his basement on, like, Skype or something, but... He filmed his cameo on Cameo. <laughs> uh, he, had to, he had to get on the Star Wars set now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait to talk about Andor at some point. Oh, that yeah. That show is so good. It's... <laughs> I know, like, we say this is a breath of fresh air for Star Wars a lot, but, like... Um, for the first time, it's like Andor just kind of feels like it's more science fiction than science fantasy for Star yeah. Wars. That's oh, a nice sure. change of pace. But yeah, and that's, this is that's a story for another time. <laughs> I will say real quick, uh, for the record, at the time of recording this, this is uh, being recorded before the finale comes up next week, mm-hmm. and we have not seen a single lightsaber in this entire show. If they bring out the lightsaber in the final episode, I don't care how much it's used, I'll riot. <laughs> I mean, we'll no. see. No, they've been smart with this. I don't know. Do you think Andy Serkis is actually going to be Snoke? Do you think it's going to be the I same character? <laughs> I hope it's not. I was surprised to see him in the show. But I was too. I didn't. Know he was, he was I, I thought it. he was great. Yeah, he is great. Oh, uh, man. Okay, yeah, I guess we can wrap <laughs> this up for tonight. Uh, I think we're going to try to do, like, a. you finally caught up with the boys, so I, I really want to do a boys discussion with you next. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in the meantime, Chris, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over on Instagram, Letterboxd, and I have a new one, actually, that I discovered, uh, which is called, look it up again, 
uh, serialized, which is essentially letterbox, but for TV shows. So, Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Uh, I haven't done too much on it yet, but you can check me out on there. Cool. Uh, Yeah, you can find me on Letterboxd as well. Um, You can also find me on the hellhole known as Twitter before it gets destroyed by (laughs) Elon Musk. Um, I'm at Alex Galucky. And, yeah. I don't know how to wrap this up. Do we play the, the Rihanna song? (laughs) <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't think it was that good not that i heard it because people were too busy yelling let's fucking go <laughs> just people filming themselves having their friends film them re- reacting to a woman crying on screen like let's go <laughs> <laughs>